John. Great. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Good stuff. Well, as John said, it's great to be back. Thanks for the invitation to you know, to speak again to the conference. It's fantastic. I always enjoy the TAFAC. Um, at first, a disclaimer. Uh, I'm not sure I'll beat um, Ali's two six-month-old twins, but uh, I have a, a very ill three-month-old and a three-year-old, and I've caught their cold. So apologies um, if I'm a little bit snotty as we go through. Uh, lovely. Anyway, I'm here to tell you about the Living Lomans Landscape Partnership. It's a very exciting new project taking place very close by in West Fife and Kinrosshire. Um, you will have heard, no doubt, of the Tay Landscape Partnership, but we're really fortunate in this local area to have two major HLF-funded landscape partnerships going on. So what I'm going to tell you about today is a bit of an introduction um, to the work of the partnership, what the project is, how it's funded, what kind of things we've been getting up to. I believe uh, you may have had some talks on the development process of this project before, but hopefully now I'm going to update you on our first year of the historic landscape part of this uh, very wide-reaching um, community initiative. Um, so here's our, our logo here, um, which shows the variety of different landscapes that we're working in, in the area of the, the Lomond Hills. And who are we? Well, it's, it's a very broad-ranging um, partnership. My role in it is as a consultant. I'm, uh, the managing consultant for the archaeology project, which I'll come to. Um, but the main partners who have applied for the, the core 1.7 million uh, HLF fund are Falkland Centre for Stewardship down here, based <coughs> at Falkland Estate, of course, and the main other large one is Fife uh, Coastal Countryside Trust. Um, but there are a whole range of other local community groups um, and community organisations, such as Kinross Museums, um, through David Munro, who's on the board as well. Um, and also we have Mark Inch uh, Heritage Group, uh, and a variety of others have actually begun to come on board as well through Leslie and Glen Ross's Heritage Centre as well. So it's, it's a very broad church, and it's been very interesting to see all these organisations interacting as the project gets going. And what are our aims? Well, collectively the stated aim is to try and reconnect people in the area to the living legacy of the Lomond Hills, but also the neighbouring hill range and the community surrounding it in Bernarty. Um, so it covers quite a broad spectrum of different communities in the West Fife area, from um, old mining communities all the way to the perhaps somewhat more affluent areas of, of Falkland um, and heritage uh, villages as well of that nature and Northern uh, Glen, Glen Rothis, and also we're welcoming in communities of course surrounding the main um, project boundary. It's a three year project, um, so it's, a, it's quite a challenge to get through um, such a large range of different initiatives in three years, but um, we've, we've stepped up to the bar so far, we're we'll going on to 2016. Where are we working? Well I said a bit more about this, but um, Technically speaking, the Lomond Hills, the park, takes in the, the regional park, of course, um, which is managed by the, the local ranger service, who are also involved. Um, it also takes in Bishop Hill, but what we can see here is East Lomond, these two main, the Paps of Fife, sometimes called. Depending on who you talk to in the area, they have different names as well, so this is Falkland Hill to some, East Lomond to others. We also have Bishop Hill just out of view, um, also taken in. So here's your map, give you a sense. Look, Leaven was originally within, um, but sadly came out quite late on. It takes in the Loch or Meadows Park down here, um, the main regional park, and the just to the edge of the Eden River up here. So if you see local community area you're interested in, do come and have a chat with me afterwards. How are we organised? Well, in quite a tight organisation um, for the process involved and all the different organisations involved. So it's divided into a series of programme headers. Uh, many of the, the landscape partnership um, funding streams uh, take similar um, process and organisation. So we have rural skills which is involved bringing in unemployed individuals, young individuals, training them up so they can work in uh, forestry industries for instance, conservation area. Um, biodiversity um, as part of our Wild Places uh, programs. 
the historic landscape, which we'll be talking about in a minute, and the living heritage, which comes a whole range of um, stories of the landscape, crafts working, and we've just had a very exciting craft collaboration project, in fact, with bringing together artists to work with local schools as well. And exploring the Lomans is, you know, one of the core aspects of trying to get people out into the landscape. So one of the aspects of that has been a great new project called uh, Journeys into the Hills, which every Fife school child now has a passport to the hills. Um, which gives us a whole range of things, including how to identify objects for you and things like that. So it's, it's great fun. Um, but I'm going to talk about the historic landscape, obviously, because we can't go through all of it in 20 minutes. There are a number of projects within that. Those which include archaeology are those I've highlighted here. The main one, though, which uh, I'm managing is Discover the Ancient Lomans. Um, but in my role is basically to feed in to the other projects as well and to help them through. So we've been doing some Geophysical survey with Mark Inch Parish Church, great restoration work going on there to reveal their Romanesque arch. And at Lockwell Castle, we've just got going with a, a exciting program of clearance works and restoration of that really wonderful medieval um, ruin there. Um, we did the development phase to inform the whole process of these projects, uh, which involved drawing down the, the historic environment records. And it showed us the widespread of archaeological sites. Now, I'm not going to break down everything today and take you through the whole historic landscape of the area. That's a talk in itself. But what was good about that process is it showed us there's been quite a lot of work done already, as you might expect. So there's been some very good surveys by Margaret Kenilworth, for instance, in the 70s, uh, Derek Hunter. In fact, Edwina uh, Proudfoot was discussing with me earlier about her involvement in those. Project. So it's been aware that the, you know, the upland areas, particularly of the regional park, um, have a very rich and unusually well-preserved archaeological resource for what is up right on the edge of some of the industrial parts of Fife. So when we started our work there, I was itching to see what else might be out there, because although there's been a number of patchwork projects, there hadn't been one that's taken in the whole area uh, to review the, the degree of uh, preservation. Now, there are some key important known sites which I think highlight the kind of wide breadth as you might expect. Any region in Scotland has wonderful monuments. But what's surprising about this area is how few community projects have occurred, how few large scale archaeological projects have occurred you know, after the 1980s and, and, and a large number of large scale development control works, such as at Val Farm. You know, where we have one of our great palimpsests, regional palimpsests of ceremonial monuments. Uh, we come into the later prehistoric era. We have a, a range of hill forts in the area, from Bernarty Hill Fort to Dunmore Hill Fort at the other end of Bernarty, probably a Pictish nuclear fort. Um, and the cracker in the area, the iconic site, which I'll come to in a minute, East Lomond Hill Fort, which seems to be a multi-phase um, Pictish site as well. Holy sites, we divided a lot of our interpretation process into themes, I should say. One of them is holy sacred hills, um, and St. Droston is one of the key examples of that, the, the great tower there, um, Romanes Tower, to later Caputz, Lockhaw Castle, and Falkland Palace itself, of course, has its earlier earldom, uh, Caputz. Um, and into the industrial era, post um, Reformation period, post medieval period. There's a mass range of industrial archaeology out on the hills as well. And if you, I would advise you to go and have a walk up there from the Clattering Wells Lime uh, quarry used probably from the 16th century all the way through to the, the 19th century. And there are a number of kilns which represent that in the hills today. And uh, all cleared farming landscapes. Harper Lees in the core of the hills near the reservoirs there is a brilliantly preserved multi-layered um, uh, rural landscape, and you can't really see it very well, but there's a whole series of phased banked enclosures out there. Um, Discover the Ancient Lomans is our core archaeology community project, and, and as you can see, we've been trying to engage as wide a possible um, members of the community as we can, from school children to pensioners to unemployed folk. We've had people coming all the way from East Lothian to take part in our projects so far. We divided it into core training activities. So we started at, back in the spring with walkover survey across the whole area, and that involved a great deal of landowner liaison. So thanks to 
them. We, we had very few that didn't allow us on their land, which is great. Geophysical surveys then followed on when we had identified key sites. Um, we've had a range of guided walks and talks throughout the, the, the year, not just myself, but drawing on a number of specialists who are involved, not least David Munro, who I think I've squeezed quite a few, enough guided walks out of him for one year. Um, we've also got uh, our core flagship events, the community art excavations, of course, which we're doing three in one a year. We started at East Lomond. The walkover survey was a lot of fun, um, and we had a really nice year for it. Um, and what we quickly found, um, in, in a variety of different conditions, as you can see, we quickly found that um, there is a great deal more to find out there. Um, and this very basic plot, which I haven't broken down for you, but hopefully highlights that in the upland areas particularly, these red markers indicate new sites. And we recorded about 124 uh, new site records, um, and there's uh, a great spread of different dates which these relate to as well. It's important to say that also, that as with the recent Discover Butte um, survey the Commission did so well, we took leave out of that to try and look at the known sites as well and assess their condition as we, if we could to, for future conservation inform, information. Um, I'm going to focus on two little areas, Bishop Hill, and uh, East Lomond, um, just to give you a sense of the, the, the variety of things we're finding. Um, kind of things you might expect, but I was particularly pleased to see the range of uh, late prehistoric uh, settlement that's surviving. Not the best photo in the world, but rain on that day. But we've got a wide range of different clusters of um, hut circles, so like Bronze Age to Iron Age sites, um, occasionally in two little collective groups, maybe a little enclosure next to it, particularly in this area known as Glen Vale here. And these are immediately beside a whole range of um, post-medieval and also pre-improvement enclosure systems. So we've got little uh, paddock enclosures, um, probably post-improvement, which you get these kind of basic, outlined, very formalised square rectilinear enclosures in each little glen all over the place. We'd already found many of these in previous years, but we're starting to open up the picture. And the other photographs have helped assess um, that many of these sites you know, are quite visible from the air uh, and quite genuine. We've got a, a nice little curvilinear structure there with uh, a small curvilinear uh, building or smaller enclosure inside. Um, to the more difficult to see little hot circle, little enclosure next to it. This is the kind of thing that we're finding uh, across that region, and it suggests that you know, we've got some really good preservation um, and that these sites need to be entered into the National Monument record. And the great thing about doing this is that each person that's coming out, they get their name on the record, it will go into the National Monument record, get up on our Facebook page. The discovery progress process is not taken out of their hands by any means. It's part of um, the, the actual activity and enjoyment of becoming part of history. Um, we had a wide range of guys, including this ex-marine, who was a very useful person to have up on the hill, um, and didn't complain at all when the, the rain comes down. Um, over onto the Lomond Hills area, we got quite a lot of much later um, evidence. And one of the big surprises for me was the lack of recording um, so far of boundary stones in the hills. Now, um, it's not everybody's cup of tea, but I think these are extraordinarily important parts of our um, historic landscape. And in fact, above Falkland, we have a fantastic collection of uh, early 19th century governmental enclosure boundary stones. These are a particular event a very late act of enclosure was took in the commentary of Falkland, and I'm drawing on the research of David Munro a great deal for this. And we found these beautifully preserved WR 1818 stones all across the landscape, sometimes on later dike systems, sometimes at meeting points of boundaries, and sometimes in areas where they've become redundant. Uh, in a whole variety of different conditions, some broken up put into walls, some in their original condition. And it's been a great Easter hunt for people to take part in because finding one of these um, is an immediate thing for people to experience and also it's quite rare to have an archaeological site that has a, a date stamped on it as well. So the WR isn't William Rex, this is William Ray who was the government commissioner um, who undertook 
this Enclosure Act. And actually, the records are such that he was out in the landscape placing each of these stones. So the, there's a sense of retracing the step of Ray as we're doing it as well. We have the mapping information now, so we can go and assess where each of these are located. A number of other little surprises. Uh, I don't know who the antiquarian was who recorded this, but there's a number of bloomery sites identified right at the top of hills, which are quite strange. which turned out to be rather lovely uh, cairns. The top of West Lomond has uh, a huge cairn on it with uh, some quite nicely preserved later stone structures built into the body of it, which was a nice wee surprise. And a lot of this information, you know, hopefully will lead to, to more survey by the very well-trained uh, surveyors of the Commission. Um, and we also found uh, what I think is an unidentified burial cairn over near Bishop Hill, although it's slightly robbed out um, in its particular condition, um, which you can see just down here. Um, we moved on to do some geophysical survey. We did various taster sessions for those that didn't want to walk up and down with a beeping machine all day, um, just have a day at it. Or for those who are more dedicated, we could come out and have a go with the resistivity kit. But we also did magnetometry. Uh, and GPR, as I said. I'm going to tell you about one of our surveys. We've done some sort of survey work on the Falkland Deer Park, the Royal Deer Park that existed around Falkland Palace. Um, also down at Nut Hill House. And we're about to do one at um, the local castle. But one of the really uh, productive ones was at East Lowland Hill Fort, and this was a lead-in to our excavation. Uh, here's East Lowland, I should say, there's a beautiful aerial photograph by Kieran Baxter of Dundee University showing the series of um, oval um, enclosures along the top, which John very kindly came had a look at earlier this year um, to assess the, for doing some more survey work up there to get a, an up to date um, record of the site. Um, John Sheriff, that is, I should say. But this is what we, we do have mapped. So this is the scheduled area which shows this series of interconnected enclosure systems, very similar to site um, perhaps like Clash at Craig, Barry Hill, you know, you've got a clear core mass Iron Age rampart system, perhaps with this multi-phased element, which is shown by some of the finds made over the hill over the years, including this Pictish symbol stone found up there in the 20s, there's been silver ingotals from the site, uh, imported glass beads, so it's one of you know, the really nice, great, well-preserved um, Iron Age multi-phase hill forts in the area. Probably associated with the tribal grouping of the Venicones, perhaps one of their key sites. The view from the area certainly suggests its ceremonial and, and probably tribal identity aspects of the site as well. But, you know, probably part of this later into the early medieval period, Kingdom of Fief, one of the core royal sites also to be developed. And one of the features of these Pictish sites, as many of you will know, is that they, they have additional annexes added to them. They are adapted into the Alcott model of the nuclear hill fort. So you get a series of enclosures. And one of the features just in discussions with HS that we noted that really hadn't been resolved is this series of banks on the east side of the site. And the question immediately was suggested in my mind, why isn't that in the shed and daring? What is it? So um, what we wanted to look at was a large shoulder of land here to see if indeed, as with other sites, this was actually within the hill fort at some point. So we did geophysical surveys. This is just one part of it. Um, lots of uh, white and black blobs, as I'm sure you're used to with these things. So it takes a while to get your eye into. We did radar on the summit as well across some of these. Um, I haven't got those results for you today. Do approach me if you want to know. And we also did some transects across here. Now this is the, the plot which was across, a ladder across this main uh, area. Now suffice to say, it is an extinguished uh, volcano about 300 million years old. There was a lot of igneous geology, as you might expect, up to about this area here. But one of the things about the Logan Hills is that it's quite complex geology. So that you get a bedding of sandstone um, and limestone um, punctuated by igneous uh, dikes. And that's what we have in East Longland as well around it. Um, and the geology changed over here, which is fortunate for us because we got this little feature. Oh, there we go. Come on. Why is it done? I must have clicked the wrong button. <coughs> All right, guys. Getting too excited. Right, there we go. Um, 
And what we found was this uh, curvilinear feature associated here, this low resistance feature with a high resistance interior. Not the best um, uh, feature in the world, anomaly I've seen, but nonetheless, definitely there and a good target for our excavation. So we opened up uh, across half of that feature, um, essentially just to see what the state of preservation in archaeology is. Now, it's an unimproved landscape. If you've ever been up there, you wouldn't expect the subsoil to be particularly deep. So, to be honest, I wasn't expecting a great deal. But it became immediately apparent that we have a very, very complex and deep archaeological resource underlying the undulating turfs up there. So, this is another Kieran's aerial shot showing some of our school groups in action um, in the, the trench. They came out for days. We also did little workshops in the tent nearby um, about arts and literacy with some of our other partners. And here's the uh, immediate sort of removal of the, the uh, first subsoil. And you can see this arcing wall coming through here. Um, we, we did extend the trench later to try and see what was going on with this wall. It's quite well made. It's got nice facing stones on it. It's got um, some interior core to it. It's quite shallow though, and it's clearly been robbed out here and there. Um, and it's not really going anywhere, which was quite unusual. What seemed to be the case is, more and more we investigated this, it's been truncated. This wall has actually been cut across here. And this massive stone here turned out to be uh, another wall coming through there. We've got this curious box feature, um, a number of stone settings around it, and another wall um, appeared down here. Um, what was very surprising is that all this material that you can see above here, this is early on in the dig, is filled with burnt bone. It's got a wash of charcoal across the site, and that was about 15 centimetres deep. So the whole site is covered with sort of deposit, redeposited midden material, washed down midden material. It was very rich. Um, as we went down through this, we revealed some more of the details of this structure, a series of finds along the wall, um, hex face, which I'll take you through in a minute. And in fact, this midden material did have quite a lot of finds in it as well. Um, and we're very, you know, we're not that far under the turf here as well. So. Um, it's just great, but it, what it came apparent to me in the first week is, you know, we're not going to dig this whole thing, we're not going to resolve this story. So the aim really was it turned into an evaluation, a really nice evaluation at that. Um, so after removing this uh, midden material, we came down onto a series of these stone setting features, which I interpret um, as post pads. Um, we, didn't get, uh, we didn't have the time to go all the way into these and sample them. Um, they uh, have been planned, of course, and they were photographed. They do come into patronation, so we, we block the site and got, there's another one here, there's another one potentially here. There is an indication that these are in lines, but what I think we're dealing with is a multi-phase occupation, really. And that was played out when we looked at other aspects of the site. So this is our truncated wall here. And this wall is actually later than this one. So we've got another smaller feature here. This is a cut feature with a lump of iron slag, which is the, the base of a kiln. The flue fragment still visible on it, and a whole range of um, burnt daub ceramics around it, which is probably I'm interpreting as a disturbed uh, small ironworking site. A curious little box feature next to it, which was half sectioned, um, a very plain fill with it, so animal bone, burnt bone at the bottom, and these curiously, clearly selected coloured sandstone uh, fragments at the base of it. Is it part of a metalworking site associated with it? Is this part and parcel associated with our, our small metalworking cut feature? We don't know at the moment. We've still got a lot of post decks to do, radiocarbon dates I can't give you. But what we do have is a range of finds. This is just a couple of them. We had about three whetstones, quite well preserved whetstones, a um, variety of different sizes and shapes. Um, what date is this thing? Well, we've got two fragments of what look like ignit or jet um, bangle features or armlets, um, which do have a late Iron Age uh, use, but you know you also get them in the Bronze Age. Um, and it, but what it suggests is might have imported wares here. If this is indeed Northumbrian or would be jet, then it, it ties in the idea of a location um, uh, on a trade route, North Sea trade route. We also got coast spindle whirl. Here, quite nicely preserved fragment. His late prehistoric pottery, 
Um, from the wall, we got a series of um, pounding stones and river worn pebbles used for pounding stones, very simple stones, which have been placed within the wall facings. Quite a nice idea of ancestral deposition, um, not unknown, of course. And we also, surprisingly, got some metal fragments of ivy. Now, this needs to be x rayed, it's just at the conservation studio at the moment. It looks like a blob of iron, as many of these things do, but it seems to be a composite feature. There are non-iron fragments at the top here. I'm tentatively suggesting that this may in fact be a designed bird-headed or beak-headed fragment. This could make it a pin, or indeed a Romano-British brooch, of which you commonly find this bird motif head. But I'm in no way going to stick my neck out and say that's what it is today. That's just some ideas, guys. Um, Two small trenches we also managed to do in our three weeks. We sampled our uh, bank features you saw before. Not a great photo, but what we got was a ditch cut coming down here. And I've done it again. God, sorry about that. Nobody who is talking in front of me hold the down the target button for too long, because I think that's what happens. Um, what we've got here is a ditch cut and just a bit of stone left of it, but all the stone is thrown down the hill. So it looks like we do have a ditch with possible small destroyed revetment uh, above it or stone feature. A totally different feature just to the south of our actual buildings. We've got this bank with a stone lining at the base of it and no ditch. So we've got at least two enclosure features, which ties into the two uh, features that we see on the east of the site. Now, we're going to have to date these if they are Pictish, very exciting. It means that perhaps you know, this whole area is actually within a Pictish annex. Could well be a pre improvement field uh, boundary, but we'll just have to play out. I think it's far too substantial for that. We had open days, very well visited for the upland location, um, with about 100 folk coming up the hill um, for our weekend day, with our tents, showing people the finds. And our school groups, three school groups from Dunfermline, Glenmorthus, all had a chance to have a go at digging, as I say, and be picked for the day. Um, and that's the East Lowland side of it. Very briefly, we've just started at Loch Orr, we're going to be doing geophysics this November, and as you can see, the site's looking much better for it. We've got publications, I've got some available outside if you want them, uh, to give people a more accessible approach, the more and more technical language we sometimes have. Um, Facebook page, really do have a look at this, it's very updated all the time, uh, let you know what we're doing. If you want to book on any of our events, you can do that online through our, our uh, .org website. Just remains to say, thank you for your time. And also, um, if you're interested in taking part, my uh, difficult to see email address is down there, but just come and have a chat with me. I'm always here for a chat. Okay, that's going to be my next talk, isn't it? Right. Okay.